This episode is the second in a two-part series on the infamous hacker Kevin Mitnick. If you haven't already, I suggest you go back and listen to part one. We left last episode in a bit of an interesting place, so let's set the stage. It's 1992, and Kevin Mitnick, a pioneer of hacking and frequent flyer with the law, has a warrant out for his arrest. Faced with the likelihood of going back to jail, Kevin chose the other side out and went on the run. So where does Kevin go? What's he going to do? And how does this all end for him? I'm John Cordes. Join me while we continue the story of Kevin Mitnick and find out what the shell he did to get out of this. A question to get us kicked off. So at one time, you were the most famous hacker in the world, um, the most wanted computer criminal. What did you do that got you that honor? I hacked into a lot of systems. The world's most wanted hacker. He'll never guess my password. Please welcome Kevin Mitnick. It's a, it's, a, it's a title that's kind of cool to have, but um, I had a lot of trials and tribulations to get to, the, to that point. A lot of bad things happened in my life. Let's take a step back and see what Kevin was doing at the time when he decided to make this choice. Around this time, he would have been nearing the end of his supervised release for a whole digital equipment corporation debacle. He's done his time at this point, but he's still on a pretty tight leash when it comes to the law and what he can and can't do with computers. So, in an effort to keep lawful employment going, Kevin is currently working at a PI firm in Los Angeles. Not the most attractive of gigs, you'd think, but it does seem like it would scratch any itch he gets for things that might be a little bit morally questionable. I mean, where else would you be able to do tracking and maybe even try to play around with some level of social engineering? It's almost as close as he could legally get to his old life without crossing the line of the law. So while Kevin is doing this, he still have in mind that it's possible he was being monitored. And that's where the informant comes in. The informant tipped off Kevin that he was being monitored and planted the idea to Kevin that Pacific Bell, a company at which he'd already hacked once, had a computer system that he could use to do counter surveillance. If he didn't catch it, that tipped off was in heavy air quotes because it was all orchestrated as a way to get Kevin to break the terms of his release. After hacking Pacific Bell again, Kevin was able to trace FBI phone numbers and find out where they were by tracking their phone's metadata. He went so far as to create his own software he could use to track any known FBI number he had and alert him when they were coming close to his apartment. What he didn't know until it was too late was that this was the line the FBI wanted him to cross. And when he realized what was coming, he decided to play a prank on the FBI agents he suspected were coming to search for his apartment. And so I had a device, and I was working as a private investigator in LA at the time, that I interfaced with my computer in a scanner. So anytime these phone numbers that I, may, I classified as FBI cell phones came into my location, into my area, I'd get a warning on my computer, it would beep. One morning I go into the office and I hear this beeping like it's like, you didn't disable an alarm. Unbelievably, the beeping is coming from my office. And I go, what's that? And I walk up to the computer and it's my early warning system detected one of the FBI cell phones. And I'm going, oh my God, they're here. What I see from the data it captured is that phone called a payphone number that was across the street from my apartment at 6.30 in the morning. So they were there, but it was like two hours earlier. That's interesting. Why would the FBI be at my apartment, but they wouldn't arrest me? Then it hit me, they were there to get a search warrant. So, with this foreknowledge that the FBI was at my residence, I decided to take anything related to computers, all my computers, all my floppy disks, everything out of the apartment and put it at a friend's house. And then I went to the local Winchell's Donut House and bought a dozen donuts. And on the box I wrote, FBI donuts. I stuck it in the refrigerator. And then on the outside of the refrigerator, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Intel Inside logo. It says Intel Inside. I, I wrote FBI Donuts Inside, and I stuck it to the refrigerator. And once you know it, at 6 in the morning, my doorknob is wiggling. I jump out of bed, because I know that the FBI doesn't do that. They knock on the door. And I actually go to the door, and I open it, and there's like a team of FBI agents. And they go, you're Kevin Mitnick. We have a search warrant. And they all poured in. They're all looking for all the computers, the floppy disks, and all this stuff. They find nothing. They even call a supervisor because there was nothing there. And then, of course, eventually, they go to the refrigerator, and they see the note 
They open it up and they see the FBI donuts. Unfortunately, they didn't eat one of them, but uh, that tipped them off that I knew they were coming, so they were pretty pissed. And it's after this that Kevin went into hiding. He wouldn't really pop back into the public eye again, though, until around the end of 1994. Kevin would fly a bit too close to the sun when he allegedly breaks into the machine of a computational physicist on Christmas Day in 1994. The physicist, a man by the name of Tsutomu Shimomura, was rather skilled in the realm of cyber response. And combined with a bit of what might be curiosity, set out not really to find who did this to him, but how. When asked about this, Sutomu talks about how his intent wasn't necessarily to find Kevin, but the set of vulnerabilities that he used to get in, and why he might have done so. Listen to him talk to Charlie Rose about this in 1996. What was it that drove him to break into your computer, which was his, in a sense, downfall? Um, don't know for sure. Um, my best guess is that he knew that I do computer security research is one of the things I do, I've been doing for the last few years. He was a researcher, and my guess is that he thought that I might have some information on my machines that would help him break into other machines. You have said to me as you sat down here that, that he's not the problem, mm -hmm. that there are other people out there who are much better than he is, and they pose what problem? The problem is, in the real world, we've had hundreds or thousands of years to get used to how secure something is. If you put something on your desk, you know how secure it is. If you lock your door, you have some gut feel for how secure something is. If you lock something in a safe or in a bank safe deposit box, yeah. you have some feel as to how safe that is. But in this world, we don't really have that feeling yet. Uh, often, that's, educa that's education. Sometimes we just don't know. So you might have someone who's using some, a system that someone else said, oh, this is secure, or... Well, maybe even they weren't told it's secure, but, well, wow, I can send my credit card number over this and buy things. Do you believe we can be made secure? I believe we can. I believe we can be made, probably not perfectly secure, but we can make it a lot more difficult for people to subvert our systems, our networks, and get data about us. The biggest break in the case for Shimomura would come from a man by the name of Bruce Cobal. Bruce worked as a computer programmer in Berkeley, California, and really only was able to help by happenstance. One morning, while reading the paper, Cobol had come across an article detailing the theft of Shimomura's data from his machine. The day before that, however, Bruce had a bit of a strange experience that he was able to tie back into this. You see, Bruce was an employee at Computers Freedom and Privacy. This company used a service called The Well. The Well was a service that people could use that operated similar to what cloud storage providers do these days, offering to give file space where needed at the right price. What they told him was that he had gone far over the normal amount of space that his files were allowed, which was bizarre because the group barely ever used it. He would realize that the data that was now filling all of his storage was none other than Tsutomu Shimomura's, and he was able to get a hold of Shimomura to let him know. With this direct line to his attacker, Shimomura would use the well to set up monitoring stations. He wrote some software of his own to help, and every night would comb through what information he'd received to try and identify any patterns. What he was able to do was identify the frequency with which every session occurred, and start to create a bit of a picture of what was happening. Each attack would usually begin around lunchtime on the East Coast and would stop toward the end of what might be considered a normal workday. Then, it would sharply pick up around midnight, continuing overnight each time. According to John Markoff, a New York Times journalist who had taken an interest in this investigation, quote, The monitoring by Mr. Shimomura enabled investigators to watch as the intruder commandeered telephone company switching centers, stole computer files from Motorola, Apple, and other companies, and copied 20,000 credit card account numbers from a commercial computer network used by some of the computer world's wealthiest and technically savviest people. This attitude that Shimomura had towards finding security holes and wanting to secure them even further is what led to him ultimately putting the effort in and identifying Kevin as a threat actor here. In researching, he had found that based on Kevin's history of techniques used to hack phone companies and how this attack was perpetrated, that Kevin was the one who hacked into this device. 
Not only that, but based on the fruits of his investigation, he believed Kevin was hiding somewhere in Raleigh, North Carolina. As Markov had mentioned, Kevin was also alleged to have stolen 20,000 credit card account numbers from a commercial computer network provider named Netcom. In the investigation of his Netcom hack, Shimamura found some pretty suspicious activity. You see, the way Netcom worked was that you would dial in to receive service. So, if you could dial in remotely, you'd be able to mask your location a bit. He found that out of Raleigh, there was some weird behavior where a local switching office operating through GTE was looping calls through a nearby call switch operated by Sprint. Due to some clever manipulation of their software, Sprint and GTE each thought the calls were coming from each other and wouldn't really keep track of them. Not quite sure where to go, Shimamura would contact Sprint and try to get a hold of a technician. With their help, he was able to find the source number that started the line, and when he dialed it, he was greeted with a series of that entire loop hanging up over and over and over again. On February 12th, 1994, on February 12th, 1995, Shimomura flew to Raleigh to try to put an end to this once and for all. He arrived in Raleigh and met up with a sprint technician with a specialized antenna that would assist in finding the location of specific cellular frequencies. Pretty shortly into their efforts, he was greeted to where the signal originated from that he believed identified the attacker. It was at an apartment building in Northwest Raleigh, an apartment building where none other than Kevin Mitnick was hiding. Within a week, the local branch of the FBI obtained a warrant and was able to arrest Kevin yet again. At the end of February 1995, in a 25-count indictment brought in Los Angeles, Kevin Mitnick was charged with computer and wire fraud and had been held without bail since his arrest. He was believed to have been held longer without a trial than any other prisoner in the United States. At this point, it's only been, what, a month? It goes on quite a bit. Christopher Painter, the assistant U.S. attorney, called it a countrywide hacking spree and would tell the court, quote, he's a danger to the community. We're talking about someone who has consistently and without self-control hacked into systems everywhere. He also was a fugitive and used multiple identities. We think there's a firm basis for holding him and the courts have agreed. That in itself isn't much of a controversy, but the continuings of this trial would prove to upset quite a few people. Where it starts to get controversial is that it quickly became apparent how little control Kevin actually had over his own case. At this point, he's being detained without any trial date, and time is starting to tick on pretty heavily. Also, because of a fear that Kevin might do some damage, he isn't even allowed to work with a computer to help his lawyer sort through and understand the evidence against him. Eventually, Kevin is starting to see that the story by John Markoff that was heavily publicized was also very one-sided. For example, in the story Markov wrote in 1995, he details the fact that Kevin stole those 20,000 credit card numbers. What is neglected to be mentioned here is that there wasn't ever any evidence of attempted use of this information. And within the hacker community at the time, the file that contained the credit card information was heavily circulated for around a year at that point. Many, many, many hackers had chimed up to say they also had this file and that if you didn't, you didn't know what you were doing. Does that make it right that he had the file? No, but it does kind of set the background that he wasn't the only one and he might not have actually been the originator. Don't be fooled though, Kevin knew what he was doing was wrong. He considered himself a bit of a joyrider on the internet as opposed to a conniving thief. He doesn't contest that he invaded privacy, but what he does contest is how big of a scale he was being held to. Some of the companies filing against Mitnick were alleging that he did $300 million in damages, which he heavily denies. The biggest case for this was that he never did anything beyond copying the data. There was no evidence of repurposing, no evidence of reuse, and no evidence of him ever trying to sell it for a profit. It becomes even more apparent when you look at the 25 counts he's being charged upon. In his indictment, it only ever details his fraudulent use of phones, pretending to be people he's not, and the copying of software. It's not mentioned once 
that he would move to sell or do anything nefarious with the data, or even mention the credit card information. His whole case for himself revolves around the fact that what he did didn't result in the losses that he's accused of because he only copied the data. The high amount of damages he's being accused of would be warranted if he had chosen to destroy the data at its source. For example, the Nokia phone information he stole. The phone development itself cost around $140 million, and he only took a copy of it, then left, not really compromising the capability of work for Nokia in the least bit. The amount in which he's being charged for, though, is about the amount that it would be if he had destroyed everything and left. What's more is that while in jail, Kevin had started to do some legal research on his own time as well, and specifically pulled out a case where a former IRS employee that had copied data and had the same charges of computer and wire fraud against him received only six months in jail for the crime. That verdict came as a result of the fact that, as applied to Kevin, the data being copied did no fiscal harm to be impacted. Honestly, if I were in the same boat, which I'm glad I'm not, I'd be pretty upset myself. It seemed as though everyone in this process was just taking the lawyers at face value without actually digging into the details and precedents. The problems didn't stop there, though. Like I said, Kevin was never offered bail, so at this point, he's still in jail and waiting for his trial. It wouldn't come for quite a while. 1999, to be exact. Keep in mind, he was arrested in 1995. That's four years. Imagine that waiting for four years just to get to your trial? Eventually, he'd get his day in court in 1999 and plead guilty to four counts of wire fraud, two counts of computer fraud, and one count of illegally intercepting communications, a seemingly far cry from the 25 they attempted to charge him with. Well, this treatment wasn't the first time Kevin had been kind of screwed over by the government, and some people had started to realize this as well. They particularly took notice to his biggest mistreatment which came from his sentence just before he went on the run. This sentence we talked about last episode, so listen to Kevin talk about what happened. The, the prosecutor had told a judge uh, during a bail hearing that I could pick up the telephone and connect to NORAD and whistle the launch codes and launch a nuclear weapon. And because of this, the judge actually had a special order that I'd have to be held in prison without access to a telephone. So the only place they could put me was in solitary confinement. So I, I was there about a year. Can you do that? Could you do that? Because that would I've be badass. That would I be would badass. Be practicing. Can you believe that? Without any kind of ability to defend himself or fight the prosecutor's claims, he was locked away for eight months in solitary confinement. The prosecutor's claims were utterly ridiculous. I think part of it stemmed from the idea that hackers could connect to foreign systems via a call-in line, which wasn't inherently wrong. The thing is, if any reasonable computer or even defense sector expert had been brought in, I'm sure they would have laughed this down the road and back. For one thing, even if Kevin had access to a phone and could dial into a network or call NORAD like they said, without a computer mind you, the missile networks are siloed to their own network that doesn't connect in from any public network. It's honestly probably the best defense you can get. Just good old fashioned network separation. Can't access what you can't touch. But really, without any kind of trial he's just put into solitary confinement, it seems like a big sidestep of the law to me. And as I said earlier, other people felt that way too because while Kevin was in jail during this longer stint, a small movement called the Free Kevin Movement started to pop up. A community that centered around the magazine Hacker Quarterly started to see that what Kevin was getting wasn't quite a fair treatment in the eyes of the law. Eric Corley, who was at the tip of this campaign, worked with the community to lead events under the banner of Free Kevin. They would do things like collect funds to help Kevin get a lawyer, distribute information on how his treatment violated rights, and even go so far as to leak documents in regards to the case. I mean, they are hackers after all. What did you expect? The biggest day of protests and calls to action centered around June 4th, 1999. At this point, it's been about five years, and Kevin had pled guilty to the charges already. Many in this group believe that Kevin was pressured into accepting the plea deal he was given under the threat of not getting a trial for quite a long time, and the chatter online has only gotten more and more heated by now. 
Across the country, small protests by the dozens would form outside federal courthouses. A plane in New York would write a message in the sky. Even at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, people gathered, and they all had the same sign up. Free Kevin. Ultimately, the protests didn't really succeed in their intended goal, but they raised awareness. Awareness that this new area of the law was being grossly misrepresented and mistreated when it came to due process. Awareness that Kevin was being made the example, not out of a fair trial, but out of some kind of idea that it would operate as a deterrent for any would-be hackers. An interesting byproduct of this, though, was that the protests were able to rework the script of the movie Takedown by Miramax. Yep, they had chosen to write and produce a movie based on the chase between Shimomura and Mitnick. However, early drafts were apparently rather off-base, having written in that Kevin would use racial slurs against Shimomura all the time, and that he had physically assaulted him. Neither of those things ever actually happened. In fact, in all this, Kevin never got close to Shimomura at all. They hadn't really seen each other in person. This chapter of Kevin's life came to a close when he was released after his plea sentence was carried out in January of the year 2000. But was he really free? How could he just put this behind him and move on? It seemed like Kevin faced yet another turning point in his life. He would have to either go back to his old ways, maybe become a PI and continue his hacking ventures at even greater risk than before, or try to start something new. I'm happy to say that he found a bit of a middle ground here. Since his release, Kevin has put out several best-selling books detailing his life, his love of hacking, and the process behind some of the biggest exploiters, intruders, and deceivers. Personally, I'd recommend his 2011 book, Ghost in the Wires, or his 2005 book, The Art of Intrusion. He's also started to find legal ways to do this work. He has his own security service company now called Mitnick Security. Over the last two episodes, you've heard me mention briefly about penetration testing. Well, it's part of what he does now. Companies will pay him to try and break into their networks and identify vulnerabilities. But this time, they get to describe the bounds in which Kevin can operate and they make the rules. He also tours, doing speaking engagements for conferences and sometimes media interviews to cover his journey. He's taken his past and rewrapped it into something that does a lot of good for whoever hires him. I'm sure he still gets under the skin of some people that choose to employ his services, but listen to any pen test report and if it's got some bad results, I'm sure there's going to be at least one angry executive in the room. In an interview with Silicon Republic, he talks a little bit about how he went from coming just out of jail to getting where he is now with the security industry. What happened is when I was released from custody, I had no idea what I would do. There was no, you know, when I was a hacker, there was no such thing as penetration testing. That didn't even exist. And uh, when I was released from custody, three months later, Joseph Lieberman and Fred Thompson, they're uh, kind of well known in the US, they're you know, senators, and they invited me to Congress to testify on how the federal government could better protect their computer systems. And so I went and, you know, I had to get permission from the probation department to travel to Washington. So I, I went there and did, I submitted written testimony, I did uh, verbal testimony, and it kind of, you know, uh, started a career because then I started, <laughs> people started calling me. You know, I never thought that that would be like kind of the jump start to a career in security consulting. Um, but naturally I fell into it, right? Because um, the difference between, you know, black hat hacking and ethical hacking is simply authorization from the client. Plus I never had the motivation to make money or to harm anybody. Even when I started this, it was all about the pranksterism and the, and the knowledge. Um, so naturally when ethical hacking started to exist and companies would use ethical hackers to test their security controls, I naturally fell into that. I'm kind of like Pablo Escobar becoming a pharmacist. When you think about hacking and security as an evolving field, Kevin was there early, making waves. If you believe his side of the story, he never did it with any ill intent, more just to see if he could. If you believe those who found themselves on the other side of his antics, he was a terror to a more naive age of infrastructure and security. Either way you frame it, security standards have been set, case laws defined, and stories all built on the back of a kid that started off just by getting some free bus rides. I'm hoping one day I get to meet or even talk to the man myself because I'd love to pick his brain on the subject. Until then, I'm John Cordes. 
Thanks for listening to me explain what the shell happened to Kevin Mitnick. I just want to take a minute to thank everyone that has taken the time to listen to this so far. The first two episodes got a combined 1,000 listens or so, and to say I was shocked would be putting it lightly. I'd like to ask one thing for anyone listening, though. If you follow at shell underscore pod on either Twitter or Instagram, I'm going to start playing with a format in some of the upcoming episodes, and your feedback is going to be key in how the show develops. But that's it for now. I'll see you in two weeks for the next episode of What the Shell.